thank you very much all for coming along and uh, thank you to, to John and Doreen Bailey. Uh, they're from the North Somerset and Bristol Fungus Group. Um, and that actually been doing, they've carried out two full surveys, but as they will tell you this, this year so far hasn't really been good, unsurprisingly, because of, of weather uh, conditions. All I want to say is um, just a little bit about Littlewood. Littlewood's a very special place. It's um, not much more than just over two hectares or in old currency. Uh, our, our, the total is about six acres and we, we own just slightly under that. Um, and it was, um, it was a plantation, so it's never been a woodland all, all its life. So it's not um, ancient woodland in that sense. And we reckon it was planted around about the 1820s um, by a, a chap called Smythe Piggott, who was a great landowner and a tree planter in the area. And in fact, he's responsible for doing the uh, planting the woodland up at Worldbury on up where the Iron Age hill fort is. That's so nice. that's the background. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of the wood there, it's predominantly, and this is very unusual, it's older woodland. And so when we've been doing surveys we have always been interested to find out if there are any older specialists and John and uh, Doreen will be mentioning that a bit later on so mainly older then there's a smattering of ash I'm afraid it's got the die back which isn't uh, good news um, and then we uh, one of the last counts we ever did quite a few years ago I think we had about just under 30 oak trees in there, uh, a bit of a smattering of sycamore and a, an interesting understory with uh, blackthorn, holly, hazel, alder buckthorn, um, face, favourite red on. currant bushes, uh, honeysuckle, <laughs> gorse and some broom. Uh, so rather interesting mix. So the mix is quite unique and actually the woodland is very unique. And it is absolutely special for bats, 12 species of bat have been recording using the wood. So enough about that now, but that just tells you it is a special place. Um, I expect some of you have found that uh, COVID sort of uh, a bit of a mixture. Some things happened uh, during those um, times when we weren't able to get out and about. We studied our local area a little bit more on walks and things. And this is actually how we came in such with John and Doreen. And I think it may have been prompted because I found a wax cap uh, fungi on my lawn, or well, that might have been part of it, I don't know. But as a result of COVID, we were able to link up um, with the group and um, they took up our invitation to go and look at Little Wood. Over to you, John and Dory. Right. Okay, well, uh, nice to uh, being invited because I think we uh, owe it um, to you to do that. Um, as you say, we got, you got in touch with us basically at the beginning of the COVID um, two years. And for us to be able to drive three miles from Clevedon to go into a wood where there was nobody else was um, the perfect arrangement. Um, it agreed with all the government restrictions. And so we, we went uh, six visits in 2020 and eight visits in 21. Um, it became quite a habit for us. As Tony says, uh, this year we've been a bit uh, remiss. It's been so dry that uh, we haven't until the last few weeks uh, hardly done any looking for fungi um, and we haven't been back to Littlewood this autumn yet. <laughs> I'll just say in Littlewood, just to sort of basically come to the end of the talk, um, we have identified 164 different species of fungus in the wood. Um, and as Tony says, because it's older, it is 
very special, uh, a very special ecology. Um, we're used to going in the woods um, around Tinsfield, uh, Western Ingordano, and those woods are very, very different. Little wood has a predominance of alder, and this is very unusual around here. So it was um, uh, quite an education to visit. Um, we found quite a lot of fungi we'd never seen before. We found quite a few fungi that we'd rarely seen before. <clears throat> Little wood is a bit of a challenge. Um, when we arrived, um, and I should say in the first, probably the first two visits, we were accompanied by Phil Gascoigne, another member of our group, um, but then restrictions prevented him joining us most of the time thereafter. Um, and he did arrive with a machete to try and chop our way through. It has a very, or had, uh, a very thick undergrowth of um, nettles and brambles, which made looking for fungi quite difficult. Now, before I get into um, Littlewood in, in detail and, and show you um, a series of photographs of the fungi we have seen there, I thought I would just spend 10 minutes just to emphasize that fungi are quite important in the world. Um, first of all, and I suspect with the audience that's listening, you're well aware that fungi are not plants. Um, if anybody studied um, fungi at university over the last many years, it would have been part of a, a plant science or botany course, but fungi are not plants. And in fact, they're not animals, but genetically, uh, if you examine the DNA, they are in fact closer to animals than they are to plants. But they are now regarded as the fifth kingdom. And now we're getting the uh, respect that the fifth kingdom deserves. In the world, there's over 100,000 species have actually been identified and described, but the estimate is that there are probably between two and four million species of fungi in the world. One claim to fame that fungi have is the claim that the biggest organism in the world is a fungus. It's a colony of uh, a fungus, honey fungus in Oregon. And it covers an area of 2000 acres. It's two and a half thousand years old and it's estimated to weigh 600 tons. I know that's a ridiculous description of, of what you think a fungus is, but that is the claim that they make about the biggest, fun, the biggest organism in the world. Now, it hasn't really happened yet, but fungi are getting increasing um, publicity in newspapers. It's been a bit slow this year, because um, uh, maybe because of the drought and the heat. Um, and that publicity is fully justified. Um, if perhaps a little unreliable. So be careful what you read in newspapers. Um, but there is no doubt that fungi are extremely important to the planet. Without them, there would be no planet. So what do fungi do? What's their role in the planet? Let me, let me do the obvious things first. Let's have a look at what they do on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. And they provide food. I'm sure that's probably the first thing you think about when you think of fungi, although being a society interested in conservation, maybe it is something you should be a little bit careful about. But you do eat the raw, you do eat the raw um, or cooked um, mushroom. Um, and I'm sure now that those people who are after um, a nicey healthy diet are well aware of corn and corn is pure fungus. 
And the other aspect of fungi that I'm sure you're well aware of is the fact that they can be used in food production and particularly fermentation. So we've got a nice picture of cider, cheese, all sorts of cheeses, breads and chocolate. Perhaps that's more surprising, but basically fermentation is a major process in the production of chocolate. Um, and therefore, thinking about fermentation, you might not be surprised if I then tell you that fungi are extraordinary chemists. They make all sorts of molecules, chemicals that are used for all sorts of purposes in uh, the world today. They've been used to produce antibiotics, um, statins. I hate to think how many people in the audience are taking statins, including myself. Um, cytosporins, invention of uh, tissue rejection, and also some fungicides and a, and a range of other antibiotics. Um, I just include this original picture of Fleming's work in 1928 when he made the crucial observation that a fungal contaminant on a Petri dish inhibited the growth of a bacterial culture. And here's the zone of inhibition, and here's the culture growing, but there's the zone of inhibition, which was shown to be due to the antibiotic penicillin. The reason I'm showing it you is because penicillin was first uh, worked on in Oxford and in London, but in the early 40s, it was decided because of the bombing of London to move the production of penicillin out of London and they moved it into Elton Road in Clevedon. And if you go to Elton Road, you can see this plaque. Unfortunately, uh, all um, uh, evidence of the uh, factory um, has gone, um, but there is this plaque to show that this is where, in fact, the first penicillin that was used by and for soldiers was produced in Elton Road in Clevedon. Um, subsequently, uh, the, I, I'm calling it a factory, the research significance, it was, it was um, let me just remind myself, it was uh, the Royal Navy, um, it was a Royal Naval um, facility uh, and when uh, the, the war was finished, uh, it, it was closed. It, sorry, it wasn't closed. The penicillin work um, ended and it was taken over by Distillers Company until 1961, where they produced a range of other antibiotics, including cephalosporin, which is still used as an adjunct to penicillin when you have an infection. So I just thought I'd put that local interest about fungi um, at the beginning. As I said, this unit, and as it says here, the unit remained active until the early 60s. Now, what I've described are good things about fungi. Uh, not everything is good about fungi, of course, and some fungi produce very nasty chemicals. And this one, uh, the death cap, Amanita phylloides, um, is probably one of the most, if not the most toxic organism in the world. Um, it is an extremely dangerous mushroom. And uh, sadly, just a few years ago, uh, there was a fatality in Bridgewater due to somebody eating a small portion of this mushroom. Mushrooms also produce other uh, material and uh, Magic mushrooms are um, well known, um, and we uh, uh, we do find uh, people collecting magic mushrooms as we go around in various places locally. Not Littlewood. <laughs> we have not found it in Littlewood, and we haven't found people looking for it in Littlewood. But um, on the uh, fields uh, near Clevedon, um, certainly during COVID, it was a regular feature of finding um, young people. Uh, collecting uh, this mushroom. It contains psilocybin. Psilocybin is known as uh, an hallucinogen, um, and people, for some reason or other, seem to enjoy um, experiencing such hallucinogenic 
uh, hallucinogenic effects. Um, having said that, it is, as you may read in papers, now being considered as a major uh, treatment for mental illnesses, including depression. So um, although it uh, really is a mushroom and psilocybin is a product that really not very good for you, um, it is being developed. And I think in the future, it's liable to become um, a very important product for the treatment of mental illnesses. Now, fungi are also harmful in other ways. Uh, sorry. Um, they cause a lot of plant diseases. Um, they also cause animal diseases. I'm not going to illustrate animal diseases because my wife doesn't like the pictures I've, I've got. Um, you can get some very nasty infections of feet in tropical areas where you get horrible lesions. Um, and um, Doreen doesn't like these pictures, so I don't show them. Um, but the, the, the worst problem of fungi in humans is in uh, where if, if you get an infection in the respiratory system, they are extremely difficult uh, to control. More commonly, things that you may or may not appreciate are caused by fungi or athlete's foot, ringworm, candida, thrush, nail fungus, and farmer's lung. Uh, and farmer's lung um, quite, used to be quite common in the farming um, fraternity and can be extremely difficult to treat. So animals are affected. Uh, fungi cause disease in animals and they cause disease in plants. And 30% of the food produced in the world is destroyed by fungi. Um, I've just got an illustration here. Um, uh, 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 plant disease that probably a lot of us are aware of if we grow potatoes or tomatoes in this part of the world. Um, they, they cause a disease of the leaves, um, but more importantly, they, the fungus will get into the potatoes and destroy the crop. Um, it's, a, it's an annoying um, and still active disease in uh, particularly in the southwest of England. Um, but of course, it did lead to the uh, late blight of potato across the Irish famine, and that had uh, major implications to emigration, etc., um, from the Irish continent in the 1840s. And as Tony has already said, Ash Dalibach disease is a new disease in Britain. Uh, it arrived about 10 years ago. It has spread very rapidly. It's now causing massive problems on the Mendips, the Quantox, and we were talking to people up in Derbyshire and the, um, uh, the Dovedale and places like that, which are full of ash, and this disease is, is, is catastrophic. There's no other word for it. And this view here that I'm showing with the tips of the trees being killed and, and all this dead wood here is very typical. Uh, this was uh, taken in Taggart's Wood uh, in Western Gordano, which is incredibly badly affected. But as Tony has said, uh, this disease is present in Littlewood. And um, as far as your uh, conservation management of this wood, uh, I'm afraid you are going to have a problem. Uh, you're going to have uh, to deal with dead trees. Um, whether you leave them or whether you take them down um, is obviously a decision that you're going to have to make. Uh, the problem with it is that ash is quite a, uh, what's the word, brittle wood, and therefore um, it is quite dangerous. Um, branches drop um, quite readily from ash anyway, but if they've got ash dieback disease, um, it causes even more uh, threats to life. So let's go back to little wood. This is a lovely wood, as I say, but fungi play a major role in woods like this. And if you're interested in fungi or you're interested in conservation, like Dorian and myself, this is a beautiful place to be. When we go through this wood, what we're looking for are fruiting bodies. We're looking for mushrooms like this. But what one has to appreciate that these are literally the fruiting bodies. They're like the apples of the tree. And the tree is the 
fungus which is growing as threads in the soil, in the wood, in any substrate that they can get food from. And these are the, uh, this is a picture of the mycelial strands that you will see if you, if you look closely um, in rotten wood um, and the whole of uh, little wood, the whole understory of little wood is covered in miles and miles and miles of mycelium. And if you're considering a place like Little Wood, it's so nice to hear that you don't like too many people walking in the wood because fungi do not like being walked on. They, they like fresh soil. They don't like being compressed. And it is a major problem with, with the, the um, conservation and maintenance of fungi in all sorts of places um, that if you have too many people, the pressure, the, the, the weight of people walking on the, on the soil is very inhibitory to the growth and development of fungi. So it's great that little wood is as it is, very little visited, and that those people who do visit are careful not to make too much um, pressure on the soil and the wood. Now, what I'm going to do is, is just talk about the fungi at Little Wood, the ones that we can see or you can see if you visit there, so the larger fungi. And I'm going to restrict it to those above ground. And if you think of the ones above ground, there are two very important classes of fungi. There are the, what are called the basidiomycetes. Now these produce the spores. So you have the mycelium producing the fruiting body. The fruiting body produces cells called basidia, and these produce spores at the end. And these are like the seeds of a flower, and these are the spores that spread the fungus across the wood. These spores are produced on the outside of the mushroom. They're called basidiomycetes. The other group are called ascomycetes. And here, the spores are produced inside. So they're produced inside. Um, if you think of this as a sort of tube or a milk bottle, they're, they're produced inside this flask or milk bottle. So I'm going to go through these various sorts of structures that we get. Um, some people ask us, why on earth do you go around looking at mushrooms? Well, basically, you never know what you're going to see, as we found with little wood. And also, they are, it's just the structures. They're so intriguing and so interesting. And I hope with showing you a series of photographs, I can perhaps illustrate the different structures and why we just like going out looking for them. So we're going to look at the ascomycetes, the, the cup and flask fungi. So various structures like this. Now the first one I'm going to show you is a scarlet elf. Excuse my error. It's awful, isn't it? It's a scarlet elf cup. It's a cup, right? And it is produced on wood and it grows in January and February. And it can be quite spectacular in Little Wood. And uh, I remember at the very beginning, Faith sent me some pictures of this exact fungus which she'd taken several years ago. Um, this this uh, cup fungus is about, can be about two or three inches across and can grow in profusion on dead or dead logs, logs that are covered in moss. Well, this is certainly one of the larger cup fungi in Littlewood. And as I say, it's a highlight of the wood in January and February of the year. Another one, which is much smaller, this one is less than a centimeter across, very common and often associated with ash, 
It's Bisporella citrina and has the common name lemon disco. And it's a very, very bright uh, lemon colored, small, flat cup and, and can be quite, quite bright. Um, again, often in spring, early spring. Some of them are a bit duller. This is the gray disco. Um, they're, they're called disco because they are technically disco mice seats, um, nothing to do with music. So these are, this is the gray disco, again, very common. The, here it's growing on the end of a bit of sawn wood, um, very typical uh, white center with a gray edge. Now this one has a lovely name, Hymenocyphus fraxinius, and it exists as small little cups like that. And this, in fact, is the ash dieback fungus. And if you look uh, often in, in autumn, underneath ash trees that are affected by uh, ash dieback, you will see small twigs covered in hundreds of these very small, these, these are less than a centimeter tall, small little cups. And these cups will produce millions and millions of spores, which will float in the air and reinfect any living leaves of the ash, ash trees. So it's a very small fungus when we see it and causes this mass amount of damage that we're seeing across England and including Littlewood. So this is the ash dieback fungus, Hymenocyphus fraxinius. I uh, earlier said that there were cup and flask fungi. Um, this is uh, an unusual um, black flask. Um, it is about, normally it's about three or four millimeters across. It contains those spores inside and they emerge through this little nipple on the top of the fruiting body. Uh, and the spores will be shot out of there and again will circulate throughout the, throughout the woodland. So this is Rosalinia aquila. If you see one that hasn't got a common name, that's usually an indication that the uh, fungus is not very common. Now this is one that a large number of people I'm sure um, listening um, have seen. This is uh, Daldinia concentrica. I've called it King Alfred's Cakes. It's quite often also has the common name cramp balls. This one is very large. These are several inches across uh, and form these very, very hard black structures. Um, and these again are mostly uh, on ash. But these are huge. And again, if you leave these, these will be shooting spores out of this structure into the air to be disputed and grow on other bits of wood. You can see this is on very dead wood here with the holes of the beetles. So those are the ascomycetes from little wood or some of them anyway. Um, if we now move to the basidiomycetes, the ones that produce the spores on the outside um, and get very readily distributed, I'm gonna go through some, well, jelly fungi, some club fungi, and then get down to some mushrooms. Now in Littlewood, there are um, some very large bracket fungi. Um, the commonest uh, bracket fungus in Littlewood, which is also common elsewhere. Um, and and uh, I suspect that it, it's in, on ash, but also on oak. Um, and this will be, this could well be 15, 18 inches across. It's a massive bracket fungus. Now this is southern bracket. There is also another very closely related fungus. If you look at this, the, the underneath surface of this, it's white, um, but very flat. The other fungus that's there is this one. And if you can imagine, that's, an, that's also a bracket, but here we're viewing it from underneath. And you can see these galls 
that are, are here on the undersurface. Now, this fungus is very fussy, or at least the organism that causes these galls is very fussy. It will grow in this fungus and produce these galls, but it will not grow in this one, which is very useful for mycologists, because if you find this one, you know that it's Ganoderma planatus, the artist palette. If you want, I go to my notes because I'm not an expert on these things. Just let me see, I did write down the, the name of the fly that causes these galls. It's the yellow flat-footed platypezid fly and it goes under the name, and I apologize for this, Agathomaya wankowitzii. And I'm not going to repeat that. But it's very useful as a means of identifying the artist's palette. And this fungus is actually quite rare. Um, it tends to get, it, these two get, tend to get confused, but this generally is quite rare. And so it was very nice to find it at Littlewood. You might wonder why it's called the, art, the artist's palette, basically because if you wish, and you're very romantic, you can write John Stroke loves Doreen or whatever you want on this surface, it'll show up black. Another bracket is the cinnamon bracket, and it has a lovely name of Hapalopilus rutilans. Um, basically, it's not a very significant fungus. It's brown, it's not that big. This is probably three inches across. Um, would have been on, on dead wood. It's not very significant. And when you find it, you do wonder what to do with it and what, how you will identify it. However, if you have suspicions that it is this fungus, if you take washing soda or sodium hydroxide and put it on the surface of this bracket, it turns purple, which is very nice because that immediately identifies it as Hapalopilus rutilans. When we were just um, putting this talk together, Doreen sort of, as she does, nipped onto Google, and what she found was that this is actually a very toxic fungus. It causes kidney and liver failure, but intriguingly, um, like this, people affected by poisoning produce a strongly violet urine. So if you ever are unfortunate enough to do that, you will know you've eaten Haplopyrus rutilans. Now this is a, a very interesting fungus. I will show another picture later um, because it is an older specialist. It's called Mensularia, sometimes in a notus radiata, and it's called the older bracket because it grows on alder. And it, this fungus, um, it was great to find it the first time. It became very uh, blasé after we'd seen it, after we'd visited several times because <coughs> this, this fungus, um, one can find it relatively easily in, in uh, little wood. It's, a, it's a, a bracket fungus and grows on uh, dead or dying uh, older trees. And this was a log that was lying down. And you can see how big this is about probably 15 inches. This is a big fallen alder tree with this massive uh, alder, alder bracket. And if you find one of these, the intriguing thing, and I can't, I can't illustrate it in a, in a talk, but if you look at it from different angles, the color of these pores changes. It's a very strange effect. So this is alder bracket, um, an alder specialist, very common in the wood. There are a few other, uh, well, there are lots of other fungi that grow or affect wood. This is um, uh, a flat, uh, this again would be, so this would probably be an eight inch, nine inches across here. This is just a flat fungus grows on the surface of the, uh, the tree. 
um, probably on, on, on most of the tree, uh, uh, tree species. I don't think it's specific at all. Uh, it's claw, it's cause called the bleeding broadleaf crust because if you cut it, it turns red. It will actually show red blood coloring on the surface. And, uh, and uh, again, very helpful for identification. Finally, uh, less helpful, this is a fungus called Trimetes versicolor, has the common name of turkey tail, um, and often it does look like the raised uh, tail of a turkey. Um, it can, however, change from color from that lovely turkey color to, to pale brown. So the turkey tail description is not the one that's that reliable. If we go down through the basidiomycetes, the next one I was going to illustrate are jelly fungi. And you can see that this structure is totally different from anything I've shown you before. This is jelly ear, um, auricularia auricula judy. Um, and this fungus is probably about, that's probably an inch across, two inches across. And again, very common on dead and dying um, wood. Uh, if you read uh, textbooks, the, this fungus is often uh, said to be uh, specific to elder, Sambucus nigra. Um, it's, this is no longer true. Uh, this fungus appears to have adapted to grow on a range of deciduous trees. So that's jelly ear. There's another jelly fungus. This is Pamela mesenterica, yellow brain, and again in little wood, this is this can be um, very common and can occur in quite large amounts. Can be quite big. This example is probably only about two to three inches across, but you can get large swathes of this growing on 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 wood. Um, again, uh, often the dead wood. Uh, so it is it is so good that uh, little wood is being left. Um, and the trees are being left to die and uh, develop the fungal communities that uh, we can see today. So we've done the polypores, crust, brackets, and jelly fungi. I'm going to move on to the corals and tooth and club fungi. We haven't found any coral tooth, but we have found some club fungi, and very interesting they are too. Um, they're very small. These are probably no more than a centimeter tall, uh, quite difficult to photograph. But they have, um, I think you can see, they have a short stem with a, with a club on the top and they're white. Um, <coughs> this one is growing on the leaf. Uh, we don't see these very often. Uh, this might be because little wood is special and it has these, uh, these tifula club fungi, or it may be because they're so difficult to find, we don't have enough time or, or inclination to observe so closely other woods that uh, we've observed very closely, little wood at times. We've had a lot more time over the last two years to look closely. So this is a club fungus, tifula cetipes, um, not very often seen at all. But even better, we found another one. So this is another tifula, a different species, Spheroidea, a club fungus, and here it is with its stem and its club. Now this is quite different because it has this uh, structure at its base. This is called a scorotium, and it's very important um, a to the development of this club, but also for identification. And this is how we were able to identify it as this species because it has this black structure from which this is developed. Those who are um, have been observant about this will, uh, will perhaps wonder what on earth we've got here. Well, we've got the ash dieback fungus again. As I say, when it uh, fruits in the autumn, um, you can get a lot of little structures like this. So not only um, has this little ash twig got a tifula on it, it's also got the ash dieback fungus. Okay, if we move on, um, we're now on to mushroom-like fungi. Um, this is probably where you're feeling a bit more comfortable because you're 
um, happy to think of mushrooms as mushrooms. Um, but what I want to do just quickly is say that in a woodland, mycorrhizal fungi are very, very important. They, these fungi infect roots and enhance nutrient uptake into the tree. And 85% of plants depend on these beneficial fungi for their successful development. This includes uh, trees, but it also includes a lot of uh, herbaceous material as well. So if there's one message, I think, other than the importance of Littlewood, this is the important message. You please appreciate the importance of mycorrhizal fungi. They are intriguing because they infect plant roots. So here's the fungus coming along. This is your root. And here it's growing into the cells of the root. And it does so without killing the roots. And it lives in a, in a perfect symbiotic relationship. This, this fungus is getting food from the plant. The plant is getting nutrients in from the soil. And these fungi are very, very important for the growth of trees. And this is a perfect mycorrhizal fungus. It's a babelite. Um, it's a mushroom with, with pores. Um, this is probably four or five inches tall. And a lot of these mycorrhizal fungi are and can be quite big. Um, we have just spent a week in Northumberland looking at fungi in Northumberland. And uh, they fortunately have had a lot more rain than we had. And the mycorrhizal fungi up there were huge. So this is uh, babelite, a uh, nice um, bolete with nice pores. So this is the fruiting body of one of those mycorrhizal fungi. This is another one, shaggy parasol. Um, this is an interesting in the context of Littlewood because I remember the first time we went and we met Faith and Tony um, and the first really spectacular fungus that we found was this shaggy parasol growing under an alder tree. So this is, this could be up to eight inches tall. One problem with little wood, um, as in lots of wood around here, is there's a lot of ivy cover, um, as well as the nettles and the brambles. And so it does make finding these uh, mushrooms uh, in the, in the litter quite difficult. This is uh, the clouded funnel. This is another late season, um, sometimes uh, into early, uh, late, late season. So November, December, January, you can often find this along with the uh, Scarlet Elf Cup. But it looks like, it's supposed to look like clouds. It's a good description. Just another example of fungi hiding away under the uh, ivy leaves. This is the tawny funnel. Um, you can just about see that it's funnel shaped. Um, again, quite common in the woodland of, of Littlewood. So these are all mycorrhizal fungi. They're all helping the trees to grow. Um, as probably is this one, this has a lovely name, Leucocomprinus brevisonii. Uh, the common name of the skull cap dappling because of its uh, skull cap on the top here. I mean, a very beautiful uh, white with black cap um, mushroom. Uh, again, as you can see, growing in this lower litter um, and benefiting from the relationship with the trees and helping the trees to grow. Um, so you've got the mycorrhizal fungi and you've also got fungi which are saprophytes, i.e. growing, as some of the ones I've shown you earlier, growing on dead tissue. And these are equally important in the wood because they get rid of the wood, they recycle the wood, they recycle the leaves. Um, and so uh, without the recyclers, this, the, the material would just build up. So you've got the recyclers would get rid of the leaves, the, wood, the twigs, etc. And then 
at the side, you've got the mycorrhizal ones, which are helping the trees to grow. So you've got these two groups of fungi in this wood. What I've got here are some bonnets. This wood is really rich in bonnets. Um, I think the number of bonnets that it, it has is 24. I think that was the number when I counted it. So 24 different types of bonnet. Let me just show you a few. This is the ivy parachute. Again, on growing on the leaf, destroying the leaf, recycling this leaf. Very small, probably five millimeters, perhaps 10 millimeters across. Not a common fungus at all. This is a, the dripping bonnet. Interesting fungus, has a flat cap, but the interesting thing it has is this very sticky, very wet cap, uh, stipe going down here. One of the bigger bonnets is the burgundy drop bonnet. It's called burgundy because if you pick this, the stem will ooze red blood-like um, liquid. And so that is the burgundy drop bonnet. But all this group, are saprophytes breaking down the material of the wood. This is Pluteus sylvinus. Every time we go out, I think we see Pluteus sylvinus. It grows on wood, uh, it breaks down wood, it recycles wood. I said it, this wood has a lot of bonnets. It also has a lot of oysterlings. These are small. This, this would be about two centimeters across at most. They are small, they're like oyster fungi, but they're small, so they've got the name of oysterlings. They're all Crepidotus, this is Crepidotus variabilis. I think we have five different Crepidotus in the wood, two of which are really quite unusual and we, hadn't, we had seen before, but very rarely. So it's very nice to find these. They're very nice microscopic, uh, they're very nice from a microscopic features. It's, it's, if you have the time, it's great fun to examine the structure of these gills and have a look at the cells on the surface. That is how you identify these, but they're really very beautiful fungi. Now this, as, as we said, is an alder wood, and alder has special specialities. It has fungi that do not grow on any other plant. And one of the groups of fungi are the alder caps. And this is one of them. They're not spectacular fungi. Once you get your eye in, they're easy to see, but they're not easy to identify. They take a lot of work. They all look very similar. And we have three species of Novcoria in Littlewood, and we'd never seen them before because we don't go to older woods. Um, as I say, they're, they're very rare, particularly in this in this area. So this is Narcor Narcoria escheroides. Um, for fun, the other one is Narcoria subconspersa and Narcoria submelanoides. But there are three species of Narcoria that we found, and maybe there are, there are about six altogether, but we found three of the Nicorias in Littlewood. The other one that is specific and only found in Alder Woodlands is Macaria purpureobadia. Purpure, um, it's a very handsome, when young, it's very handsome, mahogany type brown almost, um, uh, will be four or five inches tall, cap is a couple of inches across. It's a nice, big, bold mushroom. It develops um, like that. Um, it's still very, very obvious. And little wood can have hundreds of this mushroom in, in the litter, um, uh, in all sorts of places in little wood. So, so we've got the Nicorias, we've got the Lucarias, the Lucaria, um, again, 
because it only grows in older, it's very unusual in southern England. And there is the one I mentioned earlier, the alder bracket, and that also is a specialist on alder. There is uh, one other specialist, well, there are several other uh, specialists on alder. Um, there is one that grows in the um, cones of alder called alder tongue, um, literally uh, the, the alder uh, cone will have this little sort of reddish tongue sticking out of it. Um, we haven't found that yet. Um, that would be a spectacular find and we will, um, we haven't found it. I don't know why it should be there, um, but we haven't found it. So, so that's a, a, a quick trip through the uh, mycology of Littlewood. And I think that's where we'll stop. Tony has uh, already advertised the fact that Dorian and I will um, take people around on a walk through a little wood. Hopefully, hopefully, if we if we do when we do, um, we will see some of these mushrooms. I'm hoping it's raining today, which is a good sign. So hopefully, we'll get a bit more moisture. Um, that's a major problem at Little Wood, being drying out. But if we do get some moisture, I'm sure we will um, find a good selection of fungi if you wish to come along on the date that, uh, 2nd of November, that Tony was advertising. Thank you. If there are any questions, Doreen will answer them all. Okay. <laughs> I just thought you'd like to see one of the friends that we regularly see at the edge. <laughs> there's a rain running along the sides, and there's nearly always a swamp there. It, do, yeah. it, it does have quite, it is the primroses, the honeysuckles, the swans um, are, are a good benefit to, to Littlewood when, when the fungi are not so good. Yeah. Thank so, so, well, thank, thank you, John and Doreen. I, I, I think it's, I, I, I really have loved the insight. I know we had the benefit of coming out with you and uh, seeing a, a, a couple of the, um, the 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 parasol that that was the the shaggy parasol. Yes, um, that was. I shan't that was... forget that. That, that <laughs> was that. I remember you being excited about that being quite a good uh, specimen, and yeah, that, was... uh, that it, it was good. Um, I, what what. What struck me very much about it is uh, we know Littlewood is a special place because it we're very fond of it for a lot of uh, reasons and we, we know it's special but what what your work has actually done has gone down literally into the layers of the wood <laughs> and uh, uh, dug up these um, these one wonderful uh, uh, what was very difficult to say I'll, I'll have to not quite animals, but let's use the word creatures. <laughs> but how, and also what I've enjoyed very much is um, being reminded about the importance of fungi and um, uh, to us as individuals, to the planet, and not, not, only, not only our wood, but to be able to see the process and understand what's going on there. And the wood has now uh, since we've owned it, been undisturbed yeah, really. in many ways for 22 years. So uh, that's brilliant. Mm. Um, what we'll do, we'll take some um, questions now. If you want, there is a, if you press the hand, um, that might help us. Um, I'm going to go to my technical team for help on this. One thing I was just going to say is that um, Faith is, uh, do you want to mention about the uh, alder tongue? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I think I have seen this alder tongue ah. uh, on the cones. Oh, I think I have seen it. I thought it was a gall. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a gall. Ah. Yeah. Oh, oh, faith, right? Okay. Uh, but I can't remember whether I've seen it there or whether I've seen it somewhere else. Ah. But. Um, <laughs> I wasn't looking for it, but I do <laughs> recall seeing this funny little red tongue coming out of the cone and thinking it was a gall. Ah. So, um, but it was probably little wood because that's you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That well, seems it's well, probably we'll the place. Keep looking. I'm... Yes, yes, do. Right. 
Okay, so um, any any questions for John and Doreen? Um, Hello, Hello, Teresa. I've got, I've got this lovely book called The Entangled um, Life by Merlin uh, Sheldrake. Yeah. Uh, which you probably have come across, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, um, I wondered if you like, I mean, it's all about how the communications happen between the trees and all the plants via the fungi. And I thought you'd be able to do that in a very succinct paragraph or three, better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I mentioned the mycorrhizal fungi. So if you can imagine there is a tree and it's infected with mycorrhizal fungi, that fungus can grow through the soil. And if it meets another tree, it will infect it. So on that basis, those two trees are connected. Yeah? And that means that material from one tree can actually go to another tree. And if you have an imagination, um, you can imagine that that communication can become quite complicated. Um, and if you read that, that book, there are some strong indications, for example, that if one tree is suffering from an infection, it will communicate through the, through the mycorrhizal fungi to a second tree to warn it there is an infection uh, taking place. Now, I, as personally, I don't want to get involved in this, personally, I'm very happy that two trees will communicate, the mycorrhizal fungi will communicate between the trees. Uh, I'm just a little bit nervous about accepting fully uh, the elaborate ideas of trees talking to each other and saying, I'm ill, you know. And, and Give me whatever. something. <laughs> but, but that book is intriguing. Um, oh. and it, and it, it, it uses, it, it, it's, it's picked up on a phrase that's a Canadian uh, scientist uses the phrase wood wide web oh. instead <laughs> of the other. So she's playing on the World Wide Web. She calls it the wood wide web. And this is all about the, um, the fact that you, will, you can get, and there's no doubt about this, you can get material moving from one tree through these myri mycorrhizal fungi into another tree. Um, they showed that by um, labeling one tree with radioactivity and then showed that that radioactivity could move through the fungus to another tree. Um, and there's no, there's no doubt about that uh, whatsoever. And that book is, is quite intriguing. Um, what well, I've forgotten the title, is it The Enchanted? Entangled uh, life. Entangled web. Um, how fungi make our worlds change our minds and shape our futures. Yeah. Subtitle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Re I'd recommend it. Uh, mm. It's. Not, I don't know how what you found. I found it a difficult book to read page after page after page, but if you just read a little bit and then a little bit, or dipped in, um, it was an intriguing book. Intriguing book. Recommend yes. it. Merlin Sheldrake, anyway. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much both for that. Uh, do we have anyone else with a burning question? Okay, I've got another little question. This is oh, just, to, <laughs> just to make people laugh. Did you find any impudicus? The stink horn. Impudicus. impudicus. It's, um, this is where I cheat. I have the list <laughs> in front of me. I don't think we did. <laughs> It's um, it's it's a bit rude looking. Yeah, true. Yeah. No, no um, not found that. Not found. There are in <laughs> fact two. There is that one you're referring to, and there's also one that is much smaller and much thinner, and that's called the dog stinkhorn for obvious reasons, without going into it. And we have found neither of those. Um, right. I see no reason why they shouldn't be there, but we have not found them. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, do you have any like tips or advice for someone who wants to go looking for mushrooms, just to observe them? Any like tips or guidance? 
<laughs> I suppose I could the best the best advice is to take a take an eight-year-old with you. <laughs> because children have got fantastic eyesight. Um, and they're nearer the ground and they see things that I would never see. I mean, my eyesight's never been brilliant. Um, but take take small children with you. Um, a, they enjoy it, and B, they will see things that you would not see. Um, but other than that, walk slowly and, and just look. I mean, it, it, it's amazing what you will find. Um, and if you've not done it before, you will see all things that you never thought existed. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. I was going to say, John, because we, we've focused on little wood, which is a wood, but indeed um, if you can uh, find them in hedgerow, uh, hedgerows and uh, where fields meet hedgerows is quite a good place to go as well. Yes, I mean, uh, woodlands, woodlands are, are good. I mean, they should, they should be productive from August through till October, November. But then the other area that down here, for example, if you go to the Mendips or the Quantocks, if you go up on the grasslands of the Mendips and the Quantocks, um, then you will get a large range of grassland fungi, which are much easier to see. Uh, many of them are very colorful. Um, and so maybe now, where are we? Mid-October, um, from, yeah, from now on, or certainly, I suppose, this year, probably November, early November, get out, uh, if you can get to the Mendips or the Quantocks and find nice grassland, um, the red, yellow, orange wax caps will be, should be visible and they'll be quite easy to see. But there are basically two seasons. There's the early season where it's best to go in woodlands and while in the early season, the grasslands are not very, not very good. Um, but later on, November, and in this part of the world, if the weather and climate stays as it is, right through until January. Anyone else like to uh, I'll, ask, I'll a, ask a question if that's... Yes, of course. Hi, no, John. Um... In our garden, I've sometimes noticed, um, I think, what might be termed a fairy ring. Yes. Where you kind of get a ring of yep. uh, mushrooms sort of around a tree. We, we only get it partially because the road blocks part of it off, but about sort of a third of the way around. Is that all one kind of um, organism there, or is it multiple organisms joining up together? No. I mean, there, there, are, there, are, there are quite a lot of fungi which will produce rings. Um, on uh, on a, a Sunday, we were out at Blagden and we found a tree which was com almost completely surrounded by a ring of, of mushrooms. Um, uh, and also on grass lawns, uh, if you ever watch cricket on television, you'll see green circles often in the outfield. And they are, that's because of fungi. Um, and some of them are, as you said, called fairy rings, um, because basically because they appear, a ring of fungi will appear very quickly. Um, uh, we saw a, a brilliant ring uh, last week, uh, about eight feet across. Uh, basically what happens is that you get, um, well, one can imagine anyway, that a spore lands on a, on a field and starts to grow and it grows outwards. There's nothing to stop it. So it grows outwards in a circle. And so the circle of the ring, the fairy ring of mushrooms gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the years go on. And, and I have seen people calculating the age of such rings by knowing in some way, the rate of spread of the ring. Um, so you can, if you know how fast the fungus is spreading outward, you can then work out, if you have a big ring, how old it is. And people have calculated some of these rings to be really quite ancient. Wow. Mm. Uh, can you I see I my... a question? Uh, right, so I've got, 
I'll, Barbara, I'll put you, I've got three questions now. They're all coming in fast. So <laughs> I've now got, I've got Warren, Margaret and Barbara. So Warren has asked a question, John, about puffballs. Can we find puffballs in the, uh, or where would we go and find puffballs? In, in, in woodland and grassland. I'm trying, I'm trying to think. I mean, I get the, small the, ones on my lawn. Right, on the lawn, yes. Tiny ones. Exactly. Um, and the big one, the giant puffball, um, is generally in scruffy grass. <laughs> yeah. In the mendips. Um, yeah, in the mendips. Uh, we've seen some, I think. Yeah, you, 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 you will. And then the small <laughs> one. Fields near Barrow. Uh, fields <laughs> near Barrow Gurney, someone has said. Oh, okay. Who was that? I didn't, uh, that. I didn't We didn't notice who that was, but someone says fields in Barrow Gurney. Yeah. But it's one of those things that pops up. It's something you notice because they are interesting. Um, yes, but, uh, yeah. but again, there are some, um, there is one called Lycoperda nichinatum, which is, that is mycorrhizal, and it's specific to beach. Oh. Right. And then others, as you say, will grow in grass. Yeah. So... Um, so you, you'll see, you, you can find, I would say you can find puffballs almost anywhere. Wouldn't that yeah. be right? I would, I would say yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a, a, good, um, a good little bit of woodland, beach woodland, is around Charterhouse. That's probably worth having a little snoop around. I think that's the thing about... Oh, yes, yes. All, all, all nature yes. is good we'll to you go and um, gently explore the, the nature reserves around us and generally bound to... To, to find something. Um, can we move on? There? Um, so that, that was what Warren's question. Margaret, you've got yeah, a question. Not so much a question, just an observation that um, living opposite the children's play area here in Yatton, for the last <laughs> few years, there's been a large, I call it a fairy ring of mushrooms um, growing actually in the play area underneath the trees. Um, I wonder I, they smell like the kind of mushrooms we used to pick and eat, but I'm not brave enough to <laughs> try one. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> they're big and they're, they're sort of quite darkish underneath and they look and smell exactly like the ones we used to go and pick in the fields as youngsters. Yeah. And yeah. You can see me trying to keep quiet at this point. <laughs> um, as I say, there are there are a range. The, the classic fairy ring is a fungus called Merasmias, um, which is a smallish, pale ochre mushroom with very wide gills, um, and it's probably only an inch or two inch, inch and a half across. But I suspect that what you're seeing are in fact okay. um, mm. agaric mushrooms, like you would of the same type that you would buy in Tesco's. These are probably, right. they're quite flat on top, you know. Um, yeah. They're probably yeah. about two inches across diameter. Okay. Yeah. Mm. You know, having yeah. said mm. that, there are a group of those agaricus type mushrooms, which would make you ill. Mm. Um, we were once called to a house in Yatton, Sorry, Nailsy. Sorry, Yatton. <laughs> in Nailsy, <laughs> where um, there was this massive ring round, I think it was an apple tree or something in a garden. Um, mm. And this lady had made a pie and uh, her husband didn't like it because it was bitter and she'd eaten it and been quite poorly. And she had mm. eaten one of these fungi that look like the thing you buy in Tesco but isn't the same mm. um, so please be very careful yeah I think somebody must pick them and take them away and destroy them in case the children eat them because they don't stay there very long well I think no. yeah I mean most fungi are not dangerous but uh, I think in a children's playground we have we do a, we do surveying at Tinsfield and we certainly have reported um, well, we, we certainly report when we see death caps on the estate. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's good. Thanks very much uh, for that, Margaret. Uh, Barbara, you, you had a question? Um, yes, it's a sort of a not very good question. In Surrey, um, I found a tall fungus. 
that had collapsed, I lifted it up with a stick to look at it better. And I, um, Horn of Plenty came to mind. Is there such a thing? Um, horn of Plenty, it looks like a horn and it's basically black. Oh. And it's about two to four inches tall. Very tall. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah, remember it last being week. black, though. Sorry? It wasn't black? I don't remember it being black. Perhaps that's not perfect. This is a wood that um, David Attenborough is supposed to walk in. Ah. <laughs> but it had fallen, it had collapsed. I had to lift it up with a stick to ah. look at it. I was really excited because it was mm. unlike anything I'd seen before. It's quite tall. It was, yeah, easily four inches, more okay. five, maybe easily. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So that well, was a lucky are... sighting then. Well, there is a horn, uh, there is a fungus called Horn of Plenty. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think uh, I'd like to give you a, a it's difficult doing this because I like it, it's, uh, but if, if everyone we can give you a, a, a real uh, round of, of applause for, <laughs> for John and Doreen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's most been a pleasure. Most interesting talk, and um, I think I think it's brought Littlewood uh, back to life. Uh, in you know, it's it's lovely hearing people talk about it. And um, isn't it? okay, well, well, come back again when when you've got the next fifty species, and we'll uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> that'll be tremendous. Well, well, thank you for making this less daunting than I thought it would be. I, I've I've sat where you have and watched Zoom meetings, but I've never been at the front of a Zoom meeting. And, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you organised it nicely and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, it's been really good and uh, we've enjoyed having you here. We're a friendly mob, so uh, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, thank you everyone for coming along. Good night. Don't forget, mm -hmm. if you want to go on that walk, um, just book early and um, thanks very much. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>